Hi, I'm Elena Neal Sachs, a podcast producer at The Oregonian. You're about to hear the first episode of our new limited series podcast, The Unidentifieds. I hope you stick around for all six episodes released here every week instead of Beat Check. Without further ado, here's episode one. It used to be depressingly simple, the same sad, lonely story. A body is found, sometimes in a building, sometimes on the streets, sometimes in the woods. Maybe there's no identification. Maybe no relatives can be found. Maybe the passage of time has left the remains as nothing but scattered bones. No one knows who they were. The case runs cold. The remains end up in evidence boxes and law enforcement property rooms, waiting for another shot at an investigation. Unsolved, unclaimed, unidentified. Initially, we thought it was maybe what we might call a body dump. This teenage girl's family might not know she's missing. It's always been very close to my heart to help identify Jane and John Doe's. This is how it's gone for decades. Some version of this scenario has probably played out for all of human history, and it happens around a thousand times a year in the U.S. today. Often enough that the National Missing and Unidentified Person System calls it the nation's silent mass disaster. But in recent years, the story has been changing. I'm Reagan Mertz. And I'm Dave Killen. This is The Unidentifieds, a podcast from The Oregonian and Oregon Live. You've probably heard about the Golden State Killer. His arrest was a huge story in 2018 and was probably the first time a lot of people heard the term genetic genealogy. Criminals being caught through the use of DNA was nothing new, but this particular technique was. Instead of comparing crime scene DNA to an existing suspect, investigators cross-referenced it with genetic information other people had made public through websites like Ancestry.com and 23andMe.com. This allowed investigators to narrow their search to a particular family tree, and from there, to use process of elimination to arrive at a man named Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. as a likely candidate. They staked out D'Angelo's house and recovered DNA from his garbage. It matched the crime scene DNA exactly. The Golden State Killer had been found. None of the remains of the Golden State Killer's victims had been unidentified but the process used to apprehend him was a watershed moment for the identification of unidentified remains. With numerous consumer genealogical database companies building an ever-increasing library of DNA data as people research their family histories, it's now possible to track people down without any initial clues to their identity. It doesn't always work. It's expensive and time-consuming, and there are some ethical and privacy concerns. But this is undeniably a revolutionary time in the field of forensic anthropology. Cases that long seemed hopeless now seem solvable. Searches for long-lost loved ones can be completed, and people who've existed for decades only as lonely, nameless phantoms can, if nothing else, get their identities back. So full disclosure, I'm still in school. I'm an intern for The Oregonian. Normally, this is the time in a young journalist's career where they'd be spending their summers heading out to internships at newspapers all over the country, learning on the job and meeting peers, mentors, and future co-workers. But as everyone knows all too well, these are not normal times. So I'm working for the Oregonian, but I can't actually be in Oregon. I'm stuck here in Missouri, working the phones and taking meetings over Zoom calls, like so many others during the pandemic. I do feel a strong connection to the subject matter, though. The idea of losing not just one's life, but also one's very identity strikes me as incredibly tragic. As someone with three younger siblings, so does the agonizing uncertainty I can only imagine is felt by a person whose family member or loved one seems to have simply vanished. The ways in which DNA technology has begun to unravel these mysteries is fascinating, miraculous, and maybe more than a little concerning. I want to understand how it all works, what the limitations are, what we might be giving up to make it possible, and what the future may hold. I hope this podcast can help demystify genetic genealogy, encourage people to participate in the research in whatever way they can, and honor the people at the center of the four cases we're going to explore. Let's get to it. On August 19, 1971, a man named Ellery Sweat and his son Tim were on a camping trip in southern Oregon. As they wound their way along the Redwood Highway, not far north of the California border, 
They pulled over near mile marker 35 to rest for the night and the camper they were towing behind their Toyota. The next morning, Ellery got up and walked into the brush to use the bathroom. As he made his way through the shrubbery and fir trees, he suddenly came across a horrifying discovery. What looked to him like a human spine and ribs. He yelled out for his son to come and take a look. Then, as they were walking back to their camper, Tim found a human skull. Ellery and Tim rushed to the state forestry office to report what they had found. An officer took the report and then went to secure the scene. When investigators arrived, they found the skull about 100 yards off the highway. It was lying next to a log and had a pink and beige checked coat wrapped around it. Tree limbs appeared to have been thrown on top. Other human bones were under them too, as was a tangle of auburn hair. Upon initial investigation, it appeared to be the body of a young woman, 18 to 20 years old, tall and slim. No damage to her skull was found. Her teeth were in good shape, though slightly bucked. Her wisdom teeth had not come in yet and her fillings were intact. Photos were taken at the scene and her clothing and bones were marked with evidence tags, put into plastic bags, and then stored in boxes. The last outfit the girl wore was a light-colored sweatshirt, that pink and beige checked coat with pink buttons, slim women's Wrangler blue jeans size 13-14, and brown shoes with brass buckles. She had 38 cents in her left back pocket and a folded map of Northern California recreation areas in her right. She'd been wearing a mother-of-pearl ring with a braided silver band, and it had a clue etched into it, the initials A.L., But none of that led anywhere, and the case went cold. The remains became known as Jane Doe 79-940. Hello. Hey, Reagan. Hey, how's the drive going? Good. Um, I'm a little further away than I predicted. I just passed mile marker 20. I'm in... I don't know what the name of this town is, but there's a little tiny town, so I pulled over to set up the audio gear. That's Dave Killen, a photographer at the Oregonian. He's going to be my eyes and ears on the ground for this project. Since I can't be there in person, I wanted to better understand the precise area where these remains were found. The density of the woods, the remoteness of the location, what might have been the last thing this person saw. Right now, Dave's in his car, having driven almost the entire length of the state of Oregon from north to south, to visit the place where Ellery Sweat and his son stumbled across human remains more than 50 years ago. Where are you going right now? Right now I'm on what's called the Redwood Highway, which is uh, uh, goes basically from Grants Pass, Oregon, down to California. The number of it is Highway 199. And so you've pretty much driven from the tip top of Oregon all the way down to the bottom? Yeah, that's right. Uh, from Portland, which is where I live and work, um, down to this area is a you know, about a four and a half to five hour drive. I'm approaching now uh, this this first site that I'll be going to, if I remember correctly, near mile marker 35. That's basically what we know, right? Yes. So I'm gonna pull over uh, just uh, north of the mile marker where there's a, a little sort of cutout in the road where it's safe to park. So I'm parking now. This part of Southern Oregon is in Josephine County. The Rogue River, one of the state's most famous waterways, runs through it. It's home to part of the Siskiyou National Forest and the Oregon Caves National Monument. The Sheriff of Josephine County is Dave Daniel. On a day-to-day basis, I'm basically the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the, for the county. Dave was elected Sheriff in 2015 and began working on what would become Oregon's first cold case solved using genetic genealogy. Can you just walk me through it? Um, maybe some of the details that the detectives had decades ago, and then how you got involved in the case. Initially, we thought it was maybe uh, similar to what we might call a body dump uh, in a very, very remote rural area of Josephine County uh, on a highway uh, that leads from basically the city of Grants Pass to Crescent City, California, to the coast. There's a plastic tarp right off to the side of the road. Looks like it's been here a while. Definitely sort of ominous looking, but there doesn't appear to be anything inside it. 
Dave parked in a turnout that may well be the same spot where Ellery Sweat and his son pulled over for the night back in 1971. Much as they might have done then, Dave bushwhacked his way a couple hundred feet back into the brush. So this is along the Redwood Highway, correct? Yep. Okay. And like, what does that mean, the Redwood Highway? What does that look like? It's, it's basically, you know, your typical two-lane highway, so it's not a freeway. It's a substantial road. There's quite a bit of traffic on it, but it's, it's two lanes, and at times, you know, there's a passing lane. And where are you now? Like, are you still walking around, or are you just kind of staying in one place? I've been sort of walking a little bit deeper into the trees. Most of the brush is, like, about my height, I would say. Like, I'm about six feet tall, and m that's about as tall as it gets. So it's, I'm sure, doing a good job of hiding me from the road. And can you still see, like, very much of the sky from where you are? Like, how dense are the trees when you're actually in there? Not, not terribly dense. This is not the kind of forested area where you're in shade all the time. Like, I'm in the sun right now. But I think crucially, and, you know, in this case, it is enough to conceal a body because, you know, if, if someone's body was lying on the forest floor here, there's no obvious way to, to see it. And in fact... Um, like, there could be a body within, I would say, within 20 feet of me, and I wouldn't see it uh, just because of the density of the underbrush. And interestingly, I have just discovered some bones myself, uh, although they are n not human. There's a little jawbone here um, with some teeth uh, next to a rusty tin can. Um, so, And I'm, I'm probably 90 feet off the road, not far at all. Josephine County in the 1970s was even more rural than it is today. Violent crime was out of the ordinary. The discovery of the remains was a big deal, and generations of detectives worked on the case before Sheriff Daniel. Someone would work it, retire, and pass it on to the next detective. And the next, and the next. This phenomenon is nothing new to Dr. Nikki Vance, Oregon State's forensic anthropologist. When we see things like that happening year after year, we realize that probably this person's, this teenage girl's family might not know she's missing. So they may have not reported her as missing and they may not have facilitated any kind of an effort to instigate giving their DNA to the database to be uploaded. So we always see mysteries like this as definitely uh, solvable, but certainly more complicated because somebody's not looking for her at that point. Dr. Van started working for the state of Oregon in 2004. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in anthropology and a PhD in anatomy. A forensic anthropologist examines human remains to establish basic facts about the person they belong to and to determine what injuries or trauma they may have suffered. They work with law enforcement to identify deceased people when necessary and often testify in court as expert witnesses. In 2019, Dr. Vance spearheaded the Human Identification Program, part of a joint effort with the Oregon State Police to tackle the, quote, alarming number of unidentified remains that require casework. And really what that entails is the fact that I am in charge of identifying all of the unidentified skeletal remains that come into our state facility in addition to helping our pathologists identify decomposed remains and unrecognizable remains on a daily basis. A lot's changed since Nikki first started working for the state. The role of DNA analysis in solving these types of cold cases has taken a huge leap forward. As DNA technology more and more made what had seemed impossible, not just possible, but almost a moral responsibility, Nikki made it her mission to inventory and re-examine all the unidentified remains in her possession. The cases are so compelling and they're so interesting and they're so rewarding to solve or resolve, I should say. My motivation comes from the families of missing people. I talk to the families quite often, especially with these decades old cases, and they're inspirational in so many ways. Their strength, their resiliency is certainly what keeps me going day after day, looking for answers with these unidentified remains. But also I have true compassion and empathy for them as a, a, just another human being. I see the anguish that the families of missing kids go through every day.
In 2004, the same year Nikki started with the state, forensic artist Joyce Nagy was brought in. She was asked to create a clay reconstruction of the girl whose remains were found off of the Redwood Highway based on her skull. Joyce had started working at the county sheriff's office as a forensic video analyst, but she had a flair for art, painting murals around town in her free time. So when her predecessor was nearing retirement, she nudged Joyce to become a certified forensic artist. I grew up in a law enforcement family. In fact, my mom was an artist. My dad was a police officer. (laughs) So exactly. I'm just born and bred to do this. And Joyce went above and beyond to get her reconstruction just right. I actually took her in to see my dentist because she was missing her two front teeth. And so he, he put in fake teeth in her so I could see what the lip line was going to be sculpted like. Because that's going to make a difference if they have a real buck tooth or if they have an indented tooth. So that helped with that profile. According to an Oregonian newspaper article that Joyce had framed, UPS delivered the skull inside a bowling ball box surrounded by soft cotton. It took weeks and 10 pounds of clay for Joyce to finish her reconstruction. She got grayish green glass eyes from a doctor's estate on eBay, cosmetic eyelashes from Fred Meyer, a white turtleneck from Goodwill, and a pink plaid blazer from Sears to mimic the one that had been found with the remains. She also got an auburn Halloween wig from Kmart that's parted in the middle and held back by a bobby pin on either side. There's a black and white picture printed in the newspaper that shows Joyce carefully adjusting the wig. As she was working, Joyce was hit by how fragile the remains of this young girl were. She decided to name her Annie. So I I believe in God, and I believe strongly that he helps me move my hand to where it needs to be as far as rendering these images. To me, that's just apparent. So I pray before every sketch and I pray before every skull and that either the person helps me out or God's there with me and, and or both, you know. So with Annie, I kind of prayed over her skull and the name Annie came to me. So I actually named her Annie from the get-go. And a lot of people are saying, well, because a little orphan Annie and, and I never really connected that, and it wasn't. It was because it just, the name felt right. It, um, she felt delicate to me, so Annie just seemed right. Images of the reconstruction were sent out to newspapers all over the country, and Joyce did TV interviews, anything to get the girl's face out there in hopes that someone would see it and recognize her. Tips poured in, but nothing panned out. In 2004, Ken Selig was a detective sergeant in Josephine County. He'd been on the force for 24 years when he inherited Annie's case. Uh, I was asked to identify the person and, uh, you know, identify relatives. So we did the usual stuff, had the uh, bones analyzed, and you send those off to uh, University of North Texas. Basically, they're kind of like the center for anthropological uh, examination, uh, uh, DNA analysis, and coding in the CODA system. And then they g- get entered into a national database of missing you know, remains, unidentified remains. So that was done. And then and around that time, it was relatively new. I had been put in contact with a gal by the name of Joyce Nagy, who was just starting out doing a clay reconstruction of skeletal remains to put a face on these unidentified people. And uh, so she agreed and I sent off a skull of this young female and Joyce was able to complete her work and put a face on this one. And it, the thing of it is that Joyce, this was her first one, and she thought that the person that stood before her in this bust, a clay bust, had gentle features. So she nicknamed this gal Annie. And that's what we changed from uh, Jane Doe, Josephine County case number to Annie. So we called this case Annie case. And so for several, several years, we followed up leads. We published the photos and so on and so forth. And then the case went cold again, and uh, we lost leads. And I retired and uh, 2012 or so. You know, actually the father and son that found her, I don't think we're that far into the woods either. I mean, like you said, you're about 90 feet in. I don't even think Mm -hmm. they were that far in when they did come across her. 
Yeah, so it seems like, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine that it was anything other than someone pulled over uh, to this spot and, you know, carried her body out here. I mean, so she was there for a while. People probably did stop often and just never found her. Yeah, yeah, it's it's in so close, but so far, you know, it seems kind of crazy that, yeah, there could be a body very close to such a high traffic area for such a long time without being discovered. But once you get out here and and kind of see what makes up, like, the scene here, uh, it's not that hard to understand because you can, uh, you, you know, you disappear pretty quickly. I've continued in a little bit. I'm seeing, as I have moved now, probably 150 feet in, progressively less evidence of people, um, less junk. It's kind of something that I've thought about is, like, she was left in there, um, and people just do go ahead and leave, like, cans or bottles or whatever in there, and it's just sort of unfair. Yeah, I mean, literally thrown away like garbage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's, that's what people are doing here. They're pulling over, and some of them are dumping garbage out of their cars. And, you know, in at least one case, that some, for someone that meant taking a body out here. Even though he was off the force, Ken kept getting calls about the case. He even went to a national conference on missing children, and then he brushed shoulders with Dr. Nikki Vance. In 2016, Nikki's lab was able to analyze the remains and learn more about where the person may have come from. They analyzed isotopes, minerals that can be extracted and analyzed from hair, teeth, and bones. They were starting to learn more about Annie. It tells us what minerals your body ingested during your lifetime and over a period of time. And her analysis uh, indicated that Annie was from the Northeast and that she had migrated across the top of the United States near the Canadian border all the way over and her analysis begins to fade in the Pacific Northwest. But it puts her in this area, basically. But the most strong indicator is that she was from the Northeast. And so we concentrated our efforts through the National Center and uh, they were able to uh, come up with a lead. And it was a very promising lead. That promising lead turned out to be a dead end. A family saw Joyce's reconstruction and thought it looked like their missing daughter, but their DNA was compared against Annie's remains and proved it wasn't her. But meanwhile, an idea that would turn out to be a catalyst in sparking the first genetic genealogy breakthrough in Oregon history was forming in Ken's own home with his wife Terry's interest in tracking her family tree. He wanted me to give a sample to uh, genealogy.com, and so I did. And uh, they came back with uh, all sorts of information about my uh, DNA origins in uh, Europe and uh, what uh, nationalities that go into making me up. And also they told me that they were able to identify cousins uh, that I have. And some of them they named, and uh, they were accurate on those. Those were like first cousin stuff. And they also said I had cousins in Europe. Ken was intrigued, so he suggested the online genealogy websites to Nikki. At the time, before the Golden State Killer arrest, it was a novel and sort of half-formed idea. The vague thought that somehow these disparate uses of DNA technology could form a path to an identity. And she was also intrigued about that, but didn't know much about it. And uh, promised to look into it and let me know what the feasibility of having Annie's bones or her DNA placed into uh, genealogy or some other web search engine. And I didn't hear anything back from Nikki for quite a while. But fate continued to turn in Ken's favor. A periodic review of the Missing Children database turned up notes from Ken about pushing to find more relatives through online genealogy. The center contacted the DNA Doe Project. The DNA Doe Project was founded in 2017. It's a nonprofit organization that uses volunteers to solve Jane and John Doe cases through genetic genealogy. The organization solved its first case in 2018, and that same year, it took on this case. So all their work is through uh, people donating funds and money for them. And she is an expert in DNA analysis as well. And she has a team of volunteers that go through genealogy records, public genealogy records, I might add, 
and uh, that people get on uh, the genealogy websites and they post who their relatives are. And so they took the DNA analysis, which took a couple of readings because the DNA had degraded so much in the 48 years. But they took a couple of readings, they refined their process, and they were able to get a DNA markers, basically, from, from this analysis. And they started their work on finding out who this person was or where they might be related or connected with other people in the world. Nikki says that the DNA Dope Project turned the tables for this case when they took it on. They asked us if they could work on our case for us. So we sent them a DNA sample. They processed that DNA sample in a new way so that genetic genealogy could be used. And their genealogists worked this case for weeks and weeks and weeks, found an actual family that this young girl may belong to. And then our Josephine County detectives took it from there, went to the family, contacted them, asked them about a sister or a daughter. And lo and behold, our Josephine County detective had on the phone line the living sister of this particular person. To somebody, she was no more than garbage. You know, like That's how they saw her and that's how they treated her. Now, but, you know, 40 years later or whatever, the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, a lot of effort has gone into bringing her humanity back to the degree that that's possible. You know, thinking about standing here and for however long she was just lying here, you know, within you know, a few hundred feet of this busy highway, um, but still completely alone, um, it's nice to know that uh, that's not how it was forever for her. I hope that lands for people for this podcast. You know, we can still feel for these four people that the podcast is about and we can still respect them and have empathy for them, even though maybe others didn't. Yeah, I guess that's one, one sort of driving force behind this is, you know, you can't bring people back. You often can't hope to have any sort of justice served, but you can try to counteract the, you know, the callousness and inhumanity which with these people may or may not have been treated. And I think in this case, we can be reasonably certain that is what happened. So I guess what you can hope to do is restore some of that humanity to, to this person and to their memory and their um, remaining family. Yeah. The next time Ken was contacted, Annie's lineage had been traced from New Zealand to Sussex, England, where researchers believe her mother was born. Her mother married a Canadian man during World War II, and then the newlyweds moved to Canada. And from Canada, they moved to Abilene, Washington. And I went up to uh, Washington, the northern part of Washington, and contacted Annie's sister and told her I think I might have information. I spoke to her over the phone before we had a meeting, and she was quite reluctant, quite suspicious about the whole process, uh, not very um, welcoming at first, but after I explained more and more to it and everything, she became very excited and emotional that finally uh, her long-lost sister might be found. Annie's sister took a DNA test, and it confirmed once and for all that they were indeed siblings. After 47 years, the remains that Ellery and Tim Sweat found by the Redwood Highway had been identified. The initials AL engraved in the ring were finally explained. In a remarkable coincidence, the remains that Joyce Niggy had christened Annie belonged to a young woman named Anne Marie Lehman. It actually brought me to tears quite a few times where I, I you know, would say, Annie is really Annie. <laughs> you know? It's like, um, and we, and, and for her to be the first goal, and then to get her identified, and that I've been calling her by her nickname the whole time. You know, it's just that was really special for me. Genetic genealogy was the key to solving this 47-year-old case. So it's an invaluable tool to law enforcement, both in the sense of a criminal investigation but also in the sense that we can identify remains if there is public participation in these things and uh, the solve cases that uh, were previously unsolvable. Now, I will mention this. According to Annie's sister, Annie had never been in the Northeast. So the isotopes readings were wrong. 
All the clothing that she was found with, her jewelry, her shoes, her jacket, all of those things were of no value because no one that I interviewed, all of Annie's friends that I could identify and, and their family, didn't recognize any of those things. So the only lead that we had was her DNA. That's the only thing. Annie was the first unidentified remains case Joyce worked on in her career, and the first one she helped solve. So the case stands out in her memory. These people kind of become family members of mine, you know, because you work with them so much and for so long. And I think Annie, I was around her for a few years, you know, because we kept her up as a reconstructed in the 3D clay for a couple of years, and she just hung out in my office. And so... Yeah, you kind of get attached to these people and bless their little souls. I'm the last person they want to be on my desk because I'm their last resort. A black and white photo, possibly a school photo, of Annie shows her looking off to the right of the camera, wearing a cheeky closed mouth smile. Her dark hair contrasts with her white shirt and her bangs come down past her eyebrows. Detectives would soon learn a bit more about Annie, but never enough about why she vanished in the first place. They learned she came from a very troubled home. Her dad had a problem with alcohol. Her mom left, remarried, and had another child. It's not clear how Annie Lehman ended up in Josephine County, but Ken Selleck has some theories. He said there were a lot of young people running away from home, running away to San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district at the time. Some made their way to the remote hills of Southern Oregon, where communal societies popped up in some parts. Some tips that came in claimed Annie was possibly abducted and traded in a criminal human trafficking organization. Ken was told the family never filed a missing persons report because they were told the FBI wasn't interested. No missing person report, no search, no news bulletins on 24-hour news networks. She was gone. Even though Annie has been identified and returned to her family, her case remains open. Investigators believe someone knows what happened to Annie Lehman why the 16-year-old girl ended up dumped along the side of a remote highway in southern Oregon. Next time on The Unidentifieds. Southern Oregon is again our focus when a tiny body is found in a remote reservoir in the mountains outside of Ashland. The child was wrapped in blankets and weighed down with pieces of metal. Buried under a marker that simply says, Unknown Baby Boy, the remains were eventually exhumed, and the search began for the identity of the oldest set of unidentified remains in Oregon. The Unidentifieds is a production of The Oregonian and Oregon Live. Regan Mertz reported remotely from Missouri. The podcast was edited by me, Dave Killen, alongside Andrew Thien, Teresa Mahoney, and Carly Imus. Thanks to McKenna Bach for the theme music. You can find more Oregonian podcasts at OregonLive.com slash podcasts. If you liked this project, give us a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. You can find The Unidentifieds anywhere you get your podcasts. We'll be back next week with another episode. If you like what you hear, follow our show and leave us a review.